Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the April webinar for the National Weather Service Spring Hydrologic Outlook. This is Chris Fultz from National Weather Service Central Region Headquarters. We presented these first, the first of these Spring Outlook webinars back on February 22nd, and then we updated you with the Outlook on March 7th. Today's briefing is going to be a more specific look at the ongoing flooding in the Midwest, a look forward to what the NOAA Climate Services are indicating we can expect for the rest of April in the next few months, and also how that will impact the spring hydrologic outlook for the upper and middle Mississippi Basin, the Missouri Basin, the Red River of the North, and the Souris River drainages, as well as the Great Lake drainages. As a reminder, additional information and forecasts can be found online at www.weather.gov. Today we have presenting Wendy Pearson, Deputy Chief for Hydrologic Services for National Weather Service Central Region Headquarters, Corey Loveland with the North Central River Forecast Center, Kevin Lau with the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center, and Doug Cluck, NOAA NCEI Regional Climate Services Director. We are recording this webinar and a follow-up email will be sent with information on how to access the recording. We hope to get that out to, to, before the end of the day today. As a reminder, we are holding all questions until the end of the presentation and all lines have been muted. Should you have a question that comes up during the presentation, please do utilize the question box there in the GoToWebinar GUI and we'll address those questions at the end of the presentation. So with that, we'll start with Wendy Pearson today. Good afternoon. This is Wendy Pearson, Regional Hydrologist with the National Weather Service Center Region Headquarters in Kansas City. Our hearts go out to all the families and businesses who are dealing with the aftermath of the devastating flooding that occurred in March of 2019. Current river flood forecasts are indicating that moderate to major flooding is still ongoing in North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, along the Mississippi River with Wisconsin, Iowa, Missouri and Illinois, and the Missouri River and the lower portions that are in Missouri as well. Due to very wet soil conditions and elevated rivers and lakes, the region is vulnerable to flooding for the remainder of the spring and early summer. Spring rainfall and thunderstorms may cause additional flooding. This graphic from the USGS 28-day average streamflow graphic shows the central portion of the country with very wet and above average flows. Again, above normal flows are in the area that's circled in red here that we are concentrating this briefing on today. Also in the far reaches of North Dakota up north and northern Minnesota and upper Michigan, uh, the rivers in some cases are still frozen over with ice, so ice remains in place in those areas, so ice jams may continue to be a problem for the next couple weeks. Highlighting this again, because of the colder than normal temperatures that have been experienced in the Red River of the North, northern Minnesota, and upper parts of Michigan, we will continue to see problems with ice jams. Looking forward, moderate to major flooding is still possible across a big portion of the central part of the U.S., including eastern South Dakota, Red River Valley, the parts of southern Minnesota that are currently in flood, Middle Mississippi River, and much of the Missouri River Basin. Again, flooding chances remain higher and more widespread than last year and in several of the last years. Comparing the snow cover and water equivalent information that we showed back on March 7th on the left graphic there, Today you can see that snow cover area has been lessened, uh, but the snow water content levels remain in place in the Red River of the North and across northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, and upper Michigan, and these are areas to be still concerned about with snow melt. Also in those areas that have remained cold that are circled here in blue, the frost depths are generally still between 18 and 60 inches due to that shallow snow cover that we had um, and the deep freeze that occurred in late January. These graphics show exactly where the past precipitation over the last 30 days is shown on the left and the past seven days on the right. You can see that the general pattern of the weather systems that we have seen have been producing the heaviest precipitation over the central part of the Rockies. Uh, parts of South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Lower Michigan, and into the Ohio Basin. And this is going to continue into the future. We'll have more information on that shortly. Precipitation forecast for the period of time April 4th through the 11th, broken into three different graphics here. On the upper left, 
days one through three, showing that we will also have additional precipitation over the weekend. Days four through five is early into next week, and days six and seven, um, in the central part of the country, you can see another system moving into our area on day seven from the Rockies and moving further east um, beyond that. So we will continue to update weather forecasts and hydrologic forecasts based on this precipitation that's expected. So in summary for the seven day look here, the week one precipitation forecast, we're expecting a mix of rain and snow over the next seven days across the upper plains, middle Mississippi River Basin and Great Lakes. And looking into week two, there's a chance for two more significant weather systems in the time periods of April 13th through the 15th and April 17th through the 19th. I just want to reiterate that during this time of year in the central part of the United States, we typically get weather systems that can produce a mix of snow and convective thunderstorms. NOAA's National Weather Service River Forecast Centers in our region are using 24 hours of future rainfall in our river model forecast due to the uncertainty of timing and the amounts of precipitation and the locations where the heaviest precipitation may fall. Additional precipitation in week one and week two timeframes mean we may see the main stem Missouri and Mississippi, Mississippi rivers rise and fall repeatedly throughout the month of April. This graphic is an update from the Mississippi Valley Division Corps, Army Corps of Engineers showing that for the Missouri River main stem, um, their flood storage usage is at 43%, Upper Mississippi River around 28%, Ohio River around 13%. The Corps of Engineers is a core partner of the Weather Service and have um, granted us access to show this to you just for your situational awareness. I will turn the presentation over to Corey Loveland from the North Central River Forecast Center. Thanks, Wendy. This is Corey. I'm the uh, service coordination hydrologist for the North Central River Forecast Center. Um, and as a preface here, before I address the next few uh, short-term forecast slides, uh, we, we still are anticipating higher than normal flows in the Upper Peninsula area in the Great Lakes region. Uh, with the remaining snow amount, the frozen soils, and the wet uh, conditions as a carryover from last year. Uh, runoff will continue to depend mostly on the spring precipitation pattern in that area. So I decided to uh, focus mostly on the Red River of the North uh, because uh, we're entering, or uh, I, I guess entering the, the majority of the melt and the flooding in that area right now. And I'm also going to focus on the upper Mississippi and the Minnesota rivers uh, down to uh, Dubuque, Iowa, and then separate that into the uh, what I'm going to call the mid-Mississippi River, uh, where cresting is happening now with slow rises continuing down to the extent of the North Central River Forecast Center area to St. Louis, Missouri. And I just want to acknowledge all the uh, the feedback and the windshield surveys and people going out and collecting data for us so that we can put, produce uh, the best forecast that we can during this flood season. So on this slide here, um, uh, addressing the Minnesota River, uh, the upper Mississippi, um, down to Dubuque, like I mentioned. Uh, right now, uh, in the Minnesota River, where uh, it has crested um, and the river is continuing to fall very slowly. We're still within the major moderate and minor flooding ongoing throughout the Minnesota River. And then uh, moving to the upper Mississippi down to the Genoa, Minnesota area, we're still in the uh, major to minor uh, flood stages where most of the Mississippi in this area has crested or it's cresting right now and continuing to fall, uh, uh, continuing a slow fall. Uh, we're mostly in moderate flooding in this area. And then down to about Linksville, Wisconsin, uh, to Dubuque, uh, there uh, we're continuing the slow rises in that area uh, with the anticipated peak at Dubuque around Friday afternoon to Saturday morning in major flood stage. I've got the Ahab's graph there on the, the far uh, bottom left there. Uh, cresting, the forecast uh, is uh, forecast to crest about 23 feet at the railroad bridge gauge there. Um, and then also I didn't mention that the Minnesota crested uh, at New Ulm at, uh, on Tuesday on the Minnesota. So next slide. So 
So here we have the um, uh, mid-Mississippi, uh, mostly in the major to minor categories. Um, and then so during uh, through this area, I've got it highlighted uh, basically from Dubuque on down, uh, forecasted to continue to, uh, to rise uh, towards, uh, mostly towards major flooding. Uh, with most of the control at the lock and dams, the Mississippi River near St. Louis is forecast to crest. Um, and slowly fall, entering minor flood stage, which is around 35 feet uh, close to Saturday afternoon. Uh, the light forecast rain that Wendy mentioned, uh, we have about a half an inch to a one inch widespread. Within the next seven days, the total amount, um, that shouldn't have too much of an impact, or at least a measurable, measurable impact upon the upper uh, Mississippi and even uh, into the mid-Mississippi area. But I wanted to note that longer term rises from additional heavy rainfall potentially in the next month, within the next month, uh, remains possible. So the next slide. So here, segue into the Red River of the North Basin. Uh, we've had a number of ice jams specifically near the Enderlin uh, and Mapleton, North Dakota areas. Uh, that's indicated there with that arrow. Uh, down uh, showing at the forecast points there. Uh, so we've seen a number of uh, jumps in, in those areas and uh, as, as well as other ice jams in other areas as well when we still, where we still have a lot of snow and, and, um, and cold temperatures in that area. But the forecast is to warm up uh, uh, during this weekend, Saturday and Sunday timeframe. So in the highlighted areas, I, I have of note that the continuing of the slow rise towards moderate to major flooding on the Red River of the North area, uh, most of the snow is gone in the head waters of the Red, so the southern area below Fargo. Uh, so the snow really remains in the, up, um, the upper half, or upper half, the upper two thirds approximately. Uh, we should get a little bit of rain that was mentioned before. That should increase a little bit of the melt, increase some of the flows. But again, the uncertainty uh, continues uh, if we get into a wet pattern. And to cover a little bit of the Surus River, uh, the Surus is continuing with the slow rises. Not a lot of melt has occurred in that area. Um, and then the, the gauge near Towner uh, continues the slow recession uh, below action stage. Let's go to the next slide. And so a continuation of the flood status for the Red River of the North area, uh, I just have some highlights of the uh, continued increases into uh, major flood stage at, uh, 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 at Fargo stage on the upper hydrograph there, uh, continuing to, to go to rise in that area, as well as on some of the tributaries, the Wild Rice River uh, at Abercrombie as well. Uh, cresting uh, in major flood stage right now. And then also another uh, tributary, the Cheyenne River at Harwood, uh, continuing a rise there. So again, want to note the uncertainty beyond this weekend uh, with, the, with the transition into a potentially more wet pattern there. And the next slide. So as far as the ice threat on the, the main stem Mississippi and the Illinois rivers, uh, right now, uh, most of the threat is, it does not remain. Most of the ice is, has uh, continued to break up and melt up this past week. Uh, temperatures were a little bit cooler over last week, but the Corps of Engineers has sent ice reports mentioning that, uh, uh, that there's open water along the Mississippi main stem with the water temperatures ranging in the upper 30s in the north end to the low 50s near St. Louis. And the St. Paul Corps took their final final ice measurements of the season on the 20th of March. For the Illinois River, the Corps of Engineers reported open water on the Illinois and its tributaries with water temperatures in the 40s. So we'll go to the next slide, and with that, I'll transition to Kevin Lau. Okay, thank you, Corey. Um, can you hear me? <laughs> oh, we've got you, Kevin. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, my name is Kevin Lau. I'm with the uh, Missouri Basin River Forecast Center in Kansas City. Um, so uh, this 
first slide is just to uh, speak to the fact, uh, as Corey did, that we are already uh, in flooding. So in Montana, we've got uh, the Milk River is still in flood, minor flood at a couple of locations, but is falling. Uh, in North Dakota, the James River in North Dakota is in minor and is uh, still rising, actually. Uh, Beaver Creek is minor and cresting. In South Dakota, uh, the James River is in major, and depending on the location, uh, uh, the, the crests could be as late as mid to late April, and uh, flooding will continue through the month of April in certain locations, and I'll get to that here in a couple of slides. Uh, the Big Sioux River is falling. It still remains in moderate um, at a couple of locations. In Iowa, the Big uh, Sioux, again, same river, is in moderate and is also falling. In Kansas, there's a couple of locations in the Big Blue Basin that are in minor, uh, and they are rising. Uh, I believe that's due to uh, backwater from reservoirs, I believe. Um, and then the Missouri River below Gavins, uh, basically from Nebraska City, I think. I think that's right. Um, yeah, from Nebraska City to the mouth, the entire reach uh, is uh, currently in flood, with the exception of the Kansas City Leavenworth Reach. So again, from Nebraska City all the way to the mouth at St. Louis, the entire Missouri uh, River is uh, in flood, primarily in minor, although there are three lo locations, Glasgow, Jeff City, and Herman, that are in moderate. Next slide, please. Uh, so the next slide is uh, just a kind of a snapshot of um, what happened this past month uh, due to the uh, rain, uh, primarily due to the rain on snow event that happened in Nebraska. Not all of these are due to that, of course, because some of those are up in Montana, but um, these are the 40 plus records that we have set since mid-March, 40 plus records uh, as far as stage goes, stage records. Uh, and again, the majority of those in Lower Basin due to that rain on snow event on March uh, 12th and 13th. Uh, including, I'd also like to point out uh, provisionally, provisionally uh, we may have set six records on the Missouri River itself. And so going to the next slide. Uh, this slide I've shown before, uh, this slide does not indicate uh, whether or not a location is going to go to flood. Uh, but basically just kind of gives the, um, uh, the difference statistically between the chance that a location normally would have to get to flood stage versus uh, the chance that it currently has, given conditions on the ground now. Uh, hot colors indicate an increased chance over normal to reach minor flood stage. And as you can see, uh, the entire eastern section of the uh, Missouri uh, Basin and, and some locations in the north uh, are, are all um, uh, have an enhanced risk for reaching minor flood stage. So as Wendy pointed out, we are uh, we remain vulnerable. Going to the next slide, a bit of good news. As um, most of you probably know, the Missouri uh, Basin is is driven uh, largely by mountain snow, and so the mountain snowpack. Um, should be uh, nearing its peak accumulating um, uh, period. Uh, April 15th is sort of the date we use, and so we are nearing the usual uh, accumulating, uh, the end of the accumulating period, and uh, for the most part have an average or even below average mountain snowpack. Uh, the North and South Platte, the Platte Basin is a bit above, but for the most part, mountain snows are average or below average, and that is a good thing. Going to the next slide, uh, we do a volumetric water supply forecast, not unlike the uh, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service, and this indicates, these dots indicate that um, our uh, April through September volumes for the, uh, uh, for the mountainous west are average or below average, and that too is a good thing as far as uh, helping out with uh, flooding in the lower part of the basin. So we are calling for an average or even below average uh, runoff volume emanating from the mountainous west. Going to the next slide, as has already been touched on, uh, plain snowpack for the Missouri Basin is all but gone. 
There is uh, uh, still a remaining pack in north central South Dakota. Uh, generally, one to two inches of, of liquid remains there, although I did see some estimates in the five plus range. So there are still um, heavy pockets out there, but it is um, going away and uh, going away quickly. Now we'll get to the outlook. So I've discussed with the next slide, uh, I discussed the ongoing flooding and it's kind of complicated as Corey has already sort of alluded to. Uh, since we're in the middle of the flood, it's kind of, it's kind of difficult to um, look at the um, probabilistic outlooks. Uh, Evan? Yes. Can you hold on to that information and we'll have Doug go ahead and give some of the climate information and then we'll come back to you and Corey and um, oh, okay. give more of the hydrologic outlook. Very good. Sorry about that. Yes, by all means. Right. <laughs> Hello, this is Doug. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Thank you to the National Weather Service for uh, putting this all together and thank you for all, all of you who are in attendance today. Um, we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think it was important and uh, the need for information uh, 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 broadly uh, distributed. Uh, I'm going to sort of set a context in terms of how we got here a little bit. Uh, in, I, I think you all know uh, by the way things have evolved over the last year, depending upon where you are across the Midwest or, or Great Plains, that it has been relatively wet well it's um you're right because if you look at these maps here let's start with the one up on the upper left <clears throat> you'll see that uh, there's a bunch of sort of green shadings and numbers and all that kind of stuff alluding to uh, how wet it was in terms of the entire period of record for the last 124 years and where you see those 124s on that map um, that's telling you that it's never been wetter in that particular state over that 100, 124 years. So, uh, but also realize that uh, Nebraska, Iowa, South Dakota, uh, Minnesota, and all across the Midwest, uh, all are very high numbers. So we're, we're talking about the top 10, top 10 uh, uh, of the wettest periods from March 2018 uh, through February of, of this year. That's over the last 12 months. Now, if we look at uh, December through February, uh, we'll also see that, uh, not surprisingly, it's been wet across that same area. Uh, precipitation totals, now it's just snow, rain, everything else that falls from the sky, uh, uh, how it adds up. And you can see this sort of continuation. Um, you see the annual view, and then you can also see the three month view of how it has been. We'll update this in just a few days to add March into this mix. And if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll also see on the left um, how we compare in terms of temperatures. So there are the February temperatures rankings uh, in terms of the last 124 years. And you'll see that although nothing was record coldest, we were pretty close in Montana, the Dakotas, uh, and Nebraska in terms of uh, a top 10, and then not too shabby in terms of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, and, and Kansas, and, um, and a little bit warmer as you as you move sort of to the east in the in, for the month just of February. And again, looking at the state rankings, if you will, in the 100 actually 125 years now, um, uh, in February the state rankings for precipitation in the lower right corner, you'll see that fairly high numbers across uh, most of the region in terms of precipitation. So it's been wet. It's been relatively cold, especially as you go a little bit further west in this this area, upper upper Midwest. And then the next slide, just for context, or the next button, um, you'll see if you look find North America there up in the upper left corner, uh, we're pretty much the coldest area on the globe. And I just wanted, to, uh, and this is for the month of February, by the way. So when you thought it was cold, it was cold. Um, so just wanted to throw that in there. Next slide. Uh, again, looking at temperatures uh, over the last 30 and 60 days, upper left-hand corner is wherever you see green, it's below normal in terms of temperature. Again, this is probably not a big surprise to anybody. Uh, where you see the purple colors, in fact, uh, purple to almost fuchsia or whatever color that is at minus 25, 
Uh, that's below normal over a 60-day period. Uh, that's hard to do in the climate world, but um, it happened. Uh, so very cold temperatures uh, from pretty much the end of January uh, through, uh, through much of March. And then here's just a last 30-day sort of, if you will, departure from normal temperature in the lower right-hand corner. Again, green means below normal. Blue means a lot below normal, and uh, purple means um, just way too cold. So uh, you'll see that uh, there are reasons that I'm showing you this in terms of um, uh, next slide, in terms of uh, uh, soil, soil, uh, soil moisture, in terms of wetness, um, frozen soils, and uh, ice in the rivers and such. That kind of uh, all are sort of helping, if you will, or hurting, if you want to look at that, uh, the flooding conditions across the area. Um, again, more of a snapshot view of the last 90 days on the left in terms of precipitation. Uh, wherever you see a sort of a green shading is above normal precipitation. Green shading into blue and purples, that's all above, and in some cases over 200% of normal precipitation. Again, on the left is a 90-day view of that. Uh, those are pretty big areas to be uh, over 150 or 200 percent of normal during, during this time of year. On the right, you see the last 30 days. You see a little bit of drying, thank goodness. Um, not, not that, I mean, it does help. Uh, it could have been worse uh, up in the upper left-hand corner where the Montana and uh, North Dakota. But uh, you still see that sort of persistent over 200 percent of normal uh, precipitation uh, across uh, Colorado, Nebraska, and maybe in, in through northern Missouri and uh, uh, Illinois. So relatively wet conditions uh, continue. Next slide. Uh, just to give you a, an idea of what the winter snowfall uh, totals were and how that compares to normal. On the left, since November 1st, uh, any color there that is green or into blue is above normal in terms of departure in, in accumulated inches departure from average so they had any place you see green is above normal in terms of snowfall and then the uh, image on the lower right is since February 1st till now and note that uh, there is a number of places there in that sort of uh, oh light blue color where we actually exceeded actually it's a fairly large area over 200 percent of normal of snowfall and that's pretty considerable when you consider the areas that that uh, that, that coverage is in. So uh, lots of things pointing to uh, uh, wet soils uh, and continued issues. Next slide. Uh, just to give you a snapshot of the soil moisture, the way it's been modeled. Uh, this is the more or less current uh, image, and again, wherever you see green, it's a, a basically above normal in terms of uh, uh, of wetness. And really, no place across the central part of the U.S. is below normal, which complicate continues to complicate matters. It will t it does take time to dry out as the sun gets higher, as uh, temperatures get warmer, as plants begin to perspire, transpire, I should say. Uh, some of this moisture could be used up over time. That's, that's of course, the hope, and that, uh, and that drier, a little bit of drier conditions uh, will, will be, you know, will be coming. I guess. Next slide. I'm going to skip over this. Kevin's covered the, the snowpack and the mountains pretty well in terms of the Missouri Basin. Next slide. Uh, let's go right to the outlooks and go through those real quick. So looking at uh, the period from April 11th through the 17th, we call this a week two outlook. Uh, the image on the left is a, or, sorry, is a temperature uh, outlook, and where you see darker shades of blue means uh, better chances for colder temperatures. So you see that big sort of blob in, centered on Wyoming. Um, that's a pretty strong indication that temperatures there are going to be pretty far below normal uh, during this period. You all, and then the uh, image on the right shows, uh, basically it shows almost the entire U.S. with elevated chances for above normal precipitation. 
um, where you see the more concentrated or, or deeper shades of green, there are higher chances for above normal precipitation over this period. Wendy, well, let's go to the next slide and I'll get to that. I was going to say, Wendy alluded to um, some precipitation chances over the next week or two. Uh, this graphic, if you can, if you can see it, sort of uh, also uh, says the same thing. There are a series of three or four weather systems coming through where they're sort of lining up seems to be across the central part of the U.S. So we'll say uh, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, Nebraska, Kansas, maybe into southern South Dakota, and sort of where that image is there of the, the sort of the, the western image, if you will. Um, good chances of above normal precipitation through there, through that area. Uh, some of it could be snow, especially on the northern end edge of all that, especially with the below normal temperatures forecast for that area. And then this sort of other larger area to the east in the Ohio and so, or lower M Mississippi also showing uh, chances for above normal precipitation during this week two period, that's the 11th through the 17th being enhanced. Next slide. If we look at the entire month of April and the outlook for that, um, the image on the left, any, any place you see sort of a brownish or tan color uh, in this, in this uh, instance uh, calls for above normal, better chances for above normal temperatures. Uh, you see across sort of the north central part of the U.S. that we're concentrating on today, uh, those probabilities aren't very strong like they are in Florida, for example. They're a bit higher over that way. But still, nonetheless, for the month of April as a whole, uh, the, the outlook is for above normal temperatures across this area. Excuse me. If we look at the precipitation uh, chances, if you will, on the right for the month of April, you'll see that most of the area has enhanced uh, probabilities for above normal precipitation for the month of April. And April tends to be, uh, is, is sort of the beginning of the rainier season across this area too. If we all think about when it rains uh, in the north central part of the U.S., the heaviest uh, often, or, or for the most part, in the climatology, the most uh, precipitation falls in May and June. So um, on average, we get, we get our biggest rains during that period anyway. This is saying, at least for April, that the chances for that are slightly elevated. Next slide. Uh, looking at the three-month period, April, May, June, again on the left is a temperature indicator, and that shows that there's pretty much equal chances for above, below, or near normal temperatures. Uh, so not a strong push in terms of temperatures being uh, very hot or cold. Uh, actually, there's an equal chance for all, all three uh, categories there, below normal, near normal, and above normal. Uh, however, if you look at the image on the right, you'll see that indication of slightly enhanced probabilities of above normal precipitation with the bullseye sort of there over eastern Colorado in the high plains. <clears throat> but that whole area of green, if you will, sh uh, uh, indicates that at least uh, uh, that that area of green indicates that there is at least a tilt towards wetter than normal conditions over this period. Uh, I know that's not good news. I, I suppose if there is any good news, the northern uh, uh, tier of states does look like uh, there's less of a chance for that above normal up there. It's going to sort of, again, equal chances of being above, below, or near normal. Next slide. And just extending this one more month, May, June, and July in this case, uh, temperatures on the left again, there's a there's some indication that temperatures will be below normal uh, across the center part of the U.S., but I think more importantly on the right, the uh, image there, again, more green, unfortunately. Again, except for the top tier of states or top areas of uh, the states to the north, uh, above elevated chances for precipitation. I'll also say very quickly that we are under sort of an El Nino advisory, which means, uh, well, it means a lot of things, but in short, it has some, although it's a weak relationship, 
with above normal precipitation across portions of, uh, of the lower 48. And sometimes that sort of materializes in, that, uh, in the Great Plains area there. So that's one reason that you're seeing, that's one reason you're seeing some of the shading in that, in that particular area. Next slide might be my last. Yep. So the summary for the long-term outlooks, uh, April through June. Uh, let's remember everybody that that is climatologically the wettest time of year on average for most areas in the north central part of the U.S. Uh, for the month of April, uh, we saw a continued better chance for above normal precipitation. Uh, there's going to be a series of uh, fairly transitory storms, and I say transitory as opposed to storms that just sit there uh, in one place and sort of dump a lot of rain. It's better, if you will, to have transitory storms than it is to have very slow-moving storms at this time of year, especially where you can get a lot more moisture stuck in one place. Uh, we hope that is the case. That right now, that's what all the models and other uh, indicators are showing. Um, we have shown also in April that there is a slightly ele elevated chance for above normal temperatures. Now, for April through July, combining those last two uh, slides together, really, better chances for above normal precipitation, um, maybe a little stronger to the west and a little weaker as you moved uh, into the Mississippi Valley, but th it's still there. Um, temperatures pretty much... Um, uh, equal chances in terms of above, below, or near normal, April and June. A slight chance of being a little cooler than normal. Also, uh, May through July in the Central Plains. And I guess I think that's it. Is that it? I think so. And I'll transition back to... Next slide. Okay, who is that? Thanks, Doug. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. This is a comparison set of graphics here. This is Wendy again. Um, the flood outlook through mid-June indicating on the left what we were talking about in uh, early March. And here captured on the right was just a snapshot from the end of March. Um, but the details of what we're really expecting based on some of the information that Doug shared with you, I will turn it over to Corey to go into more detail in North Central's area. All right, so this is Corey again. Uh, so first to discuss the long-term range outlook, and these were last updated on March 25th and are valid for the 90-day window through late June. Uh, and, as mentioned, and as has been mentioned before, uh, you know, when we look at our short-term flood outlooks, that's what we're seeing immediately. Um, these are more looking at the long-term, uh, taking into account uh, a lot of the climatology or the past uh, precipitation and temperatures uh, through our uh, through our range of of, of his history. So on the red here in the Cirrus basins, uh, not really not much has really changed since our last update um, on the Cirrus. Uh, mostly near normal to slightly above normal flood risk on the Cirrus. And and again, like I mentioned before, that's going to be uh, mostly rain dependent there. Uh, and then also for the Devil's Lake area, the inflow continues to be uh, near normal uh, in that area. But conversely, what has changed in the, the last few weeks a little bit is uh, the flood threat on the, uh, the Red River of the North and uh, the tributaries areas uh, of that basin uh, with an above to much above normal flood risk. Um, uh, basically, as I have indicated here on the the lower approximately half of the basin there uh, from about uh, between Fargo and Grand Forks uh, downstream with a much higher flood risk, flood risk in that area. Again, dependent, much dependent on uh, the, the precipitation in the future. And then looking on the next slide, for the upper Mississippi basin, uh, again, our uh, long-term flood outlook for uh, chances of 50% uh, 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 chance of exceeding uh, flood levels, or greater than 50% chance. Uh, uh, again, the, the continuation of above to much above normal flood risk uh, along the Minnesota River, uh, as most of the snow has melted in, in that basin, but is uh, prone to uh, 
or is susceptible to rises uh, with uh, additional rainfall as the soils are still wet and uh, there's still some frozen soil conditions there, as well as in the headwaters of the Mississippi area. Uh, and then along the, the main stem Mississippi, again, uh, having the much uh, above normal flood risk as, as that water is routed downstream and, and uh, we continue to receive a little bit more melt. And over on the Illinois River there, the, uh, we still uh, continue to have an above normal flood risk on the Illinois. And to segue in, uh, before I segue into, uh, into Kevin, uh, we had, he mentioned the uh, provisional stage records um, in the Missouri Basin. Uh, so thus far, we've had uh, about 17 uh, stage, provisional stage records uh, throughout our River Forecast Center. So now I'm going to uh, tradition to the next slide and go to Kevin Lau. Okay, thanks, Corey. Uh, so in looking ahead, um, I'll start with the James River in North Dakota and South Dakota. So in the North Dakota, um, the river is still rising, and we, we do expect uh, the possibility of moderate uh, primarily due to ice action at a couple of locations in the North Dakota uh, area. Uh, the South Dakota James uh, is already in major. Uh, major flooding is already occurring, and um, uh, flooding is, is uh, likely to continue, not major, but uh, it probably um, uh, won't fall below uh, flood till the end of April. And that's just, that's just how the James is. <laughs> um, but uh, with that said, the mouth of the James that feeds the uh, Missouri River itself, it should actually be steady to falling uh, without additional rain. Uh, that sounds counterintuitive, but that's, that's how uh, the James uh, reacts. So it can be uh, not yet crested in the middle of the James, and it's already crested at the mouth. Uh, next slide. Uh, looking at the, the Floyd, the Little Sioux, and the Big Sioux, in South Dakota and Iowa. So the Floyd uh, is below flood stage right now, uh, but there remains the possibility of uh, renewed minor flooding over the next three months. Little Sioux River is also below flood stage at all locations, but uh, it runs the risk of seeing moderate level flooding again uh, uh, this spring and early summer. And the Big Sioux remains in flood from Watertown to basically Akron, um, and uh, even after this uh, passes, uh, we still have the uh, expectation to see moderate, renewed moderate flooding due to um, uh, rain events uh, over the next three months on the Big Sioux. And then turning lastly to the lower portion of the basin, um, as Doug mentioned, with uh, storms coming through, uh, we, we don't expect a widespread uh, long-term flooding per se, but uh, episodic moderate level flooding uh, is likely at, at uh, many locations in southern Iowa, southeast Nebraska, eastern Kansas, and across the state of Missouri. So moderate level flooding is likely in the lower third uh, it, uh, as we go through the next three months. This includes the Missouri River itself from Nebraska City to the mouth. We uh, there is a high likelihood that we will have renewed um, uh, flooding on the main stem itself. And like I said before, uh, it's already in flood, primarily minor level from Nebraska City to St. Louis. And now my summary slide, mountain snowpack is near average. Uh, we are uh, very close uh, to being at the peak accumulation now. No significant flooding from mountain snowmelt is expected. Plain snowpack is almost gone. Uh, we've set records primarily due to the rain on snow event that centered on Nebraska and South Dakota in mid-March. The plains are left wet, and as we have said a hundred times on today's call, uh, we are very vulnerable to renewed flooding. Uh, the ice concerns within the Missouri Basin itself uh, is primarily focused on the James and uh, possibly in the Bighorn uh, Basin out west. Thunderstorm activity is always the driver for the lower third, or usually is, and it is uh, almost certain to bring episodic moderate level flooding across the lower basin again. 
and so we will have a very active spring flood season. Thank you. And this concludes my remarks. Thank you, Corey and Kevin, and thank you for the climate summary, Doug. Um, we just want to stress again that due to our very wet conditions and um, saturated soils, we are very vulnerable to future uh, weather systems, and we are seeing several um, coming uh, into the central U.S. over the next two weeks. So we want to emphasize that we need partners and all of the people who utilize the information for the river forecast to please continue to monitor weather forecasts and our changing river forecasts uh, based on those future precipitation events. Um, and we will continue to update that information um, on a regular basis. And I will uh, turn this over to Chris Foltz. Okay, thanks, Wendy, and thanks everybody else for their presentations today. So at this time, we have no unanswered questions for any of our presenters. Again, I'd like to remind you that if you do have a question for the presenters about the information that they shared today, please do go ahead and type that into the GoToWebinar uh, as quickly as you can. We can pause for 30 seconds or a minute, I don't want to continue to extend it too long, but I know it takes a little while to get that information in. So uh, throw a question in there if you've got it, and we've got the folks here that hopefully can answer that for you. In the interim, while we're waiting for any additional questions, I did want to just thank everybody for joining us once again today. Uh, we know that this has been a stressful time for many, as Wendy alluded to at the very beginning, and so we just know that we're here trying to support you as best as we can, and that we're providing the, the, the latest and most uh, up-to-date information that we can possibly get to you. I did want to share, uh, Doug Cluck is, uh, will be providing the next monthly Central U.S. Climate and Drought Outlook webinar. That'll be on Thursday, April 18th. Uh, and then it, the invites and webinar information for that will be emailed to you soon. Uh, so, Chris, so yeah. yes, Chris, yeah, uh, this is Doug. Uh, just a couple uh, words about that particular webinar. This is a monthly series that we do uh, in any case, whether there's a major flood or a major drought or nothing going on, um, apparently. It's uh, uh, just to let you know that. And on April 18th, Dennis Toddy from the USDA's Climate uh, Ag Hub out of Ames, Iowa, will be the main presenter. Uh, depending upon the circumstances, depending upon uh, the, how the flooding is evolving or not evolving or whatever, uh, we hope to have a representative of the Weather Service on that to address those issues as well. And I think you had a couple more uh, questions here that popped up, so I'll give it back to you, Chris. Sure, thanks, Doug. Uh, so just a couple of folks asking if the slides will be sent out. We did send out a PDF version of the slides to the initial uh, distribution list for the invite for the webinar. If you received that invite from a coworker or someone else uh, and weren't directly in re a recipient of that, you probably didn't get those slides. So if you don't have the, a copy of the PDF and you would like it, please send an email to C-R-H-R-O-C, that's C-R-H-R-O-C, at NOAA, N -O -A -A .gov, and we can try to get a copy of those slides to you just as soon as possible. Uh, one other question, just a general question um, about how this could look for the St. Louis area. Uh, are there any indications that it could end up being like the flood of 93? So I'm not sure if Corey or if Kevin want to address that or both of you tag team that, uh, that, that question. Well, I, this is Corey. Since that's in my area, the flood of 93, um, you, you know, I, I guess I can't, uh, I'm not sure what to say, say with that, uh, um, with the, with what happened in 93 at all. So I, I don't know how to answer that question. Well, I, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, this is Doug. I, so the situation in 93 was that low pressure sort of built in, if you will, and didn't, didn't really move over, over Montana. There was a lot of sort of cool air there that drew up a lot of gulf, I mean, continuous gulf moisture over a long period of time. There's nothing indicating that's going to happen this year. Uh, uh, you know, here's the situation. It's just very, very wet. It, that We're all saying it, okay? So uh, any sort of major perturbation um, that causes a lot of heavy rainfall, even if it's normal rainfall, in some cases, will lead to flooding. I think that's sort of the bottom line. Now, whether we're going to have major river flooding, um, that, that's, that's really tough. To, that's really tough to, beyond what we're already having, I should say. That, that's so hard for us to say. There are some indications that it's going to stay wet. Um, 
the evolution of that is, um, of course, is, and, and that's why it's so important that we stay tuned to your local forecast offices as well as uh, some of these webinars that we hold, just, just to listen and find out as we figure out what's going on as well. All right, thanks, guys. Yep, I think so. Hopefully it uh, at least provided some overview there. So appreciate the context there, Doug. I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, just a lot of thank yous. Again, you know, just reiterating their appreciation for the information you guys are sharing. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this webinar up. Again, stay tuned and stay in touch with your local offices uh, for the latest information. Uh, they'll continue to host those local webinars for, for local partners, and uh, we'll continue to monitor it here from the regional and the climate level as well. So with that, we'll uh, end the webinar and tell everybody we hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks, all. Thanks.